this lecture will be on cerebral edema and herniation. Um, there are my uh, the websites me and Dr. Hughes have for USMLE type questions if you'd like to check those out. And then my um, Twitter accounts where I post um, pathology unknowns. If you want to pause the slide and read the disclaimer and make sure these apply to you. Same thing for the third disclaimer. At the bottom, if you'd like to know why I teach the way I do, uh, please view my introductory lecture. So, how would a pathologist identify cerebral edema through gro gross examination of the brain? You want to ask a question, just pause the slide, pause the presentation, think about it, and then move on to the next slide. So what you would look for is externally, the gyri will be flattened and the sulci will be compressed together, or sometimes they'll use the word effaced, and it gives the brain appearance overall a flat texture to it. On cross-section, the ventricles would be compressed. The etiology of cerebral edema can be either vasogenic or cytotoxic. Vasogenic is where you have fluid leaking from vessels, and cytotoxic is where you have fluid filling the cells. As far as I understand, these are kind of... Um, mechanisms and not necessarily something you'd be able to identify on a given slide. So just for comparison, in the top left is a normal brain. You can see the gyri are like little hills, the sulci are like little valleys. It's got an undulating surface texture, whereas at the bottom is a brain with cerebral edema, and you see this, this overall flattening of the surface of the brain giving a smooth texture. Second one for normal to edema. In the top left, you can see a normal cross-section of a brain. Um, you can see the ventricles there are uh, open spaces, whereas in the image at the bottom right, the ventricles are compressed and slit-like um, because the brain has been, um, has been edematous. So what are the types of herniation and what are their complications? And once again, just pause Go on when you're ready. So what is occurring in this image? Again, pause. Go on when you're ready. So what this was is this is a cingulate gyrus or subphalcine herniation. The yellow line shows basically the midline between the two cerebral hemispheres. And you can see the left cingulate gyrus has crossed the midline. And it looks like it's impinged against the corpus callosum and cause uh, some degree of hemorrhage there as well. Um, cingulate gyrus herniation can pinch the anterior cerebral artery and could cause an infarct in the distribution of the anterior cerebral artery. So same thing, look at this. What is in the images, normal or abnormal, and what do you see? And continue when you're ready. So on the top left, essentially normal brain, you can see the unsi there. Ocular motor nerves are also indicated, as is the posterior cerebral artery. And I think for medical students, this is a really good location for high yield anatomic information because of these complications that we're going to talk about. In the bottom right, though, you see on the left, that'd be the left uncus is herniated. Compare it to the other one that's notched a little bit but doesn't jut out as much. When that uncus herniates and can pinch on the ocular motor nerve, which is going to damage the parasympathetics, which leads to dilated pupils, or on one side, dilated pupil. Um, it can also cause the um, abnormal eye movements um, as you lose the oculomotor nerve. The lateral rectus and superior oblique will no longer be opposed, so the eye will move downward from the superior oblique and outward from the lateral rectus. The uh, uncle herniation can also pinch on the posterior cerebral artery, and cause an infarct in the distribution of the posterior cerebral artery. So one thing about us, when you look at this, it's not uncommon to see some notching at autopsy in the uncus. Sometimes it'd be very problematic distinguishing between mild edema, uncle notching from um, just artifact of autopsy. Depending upon various factors, you can see some different things associated with it. Um, the top left there shows the hippocampus and a little uh, contusion of the uncus. This was an individual who was shot, and because of the um, discharge of gas and that, they expanded the brain suddenly. They got contusions of the um, uncus, so kind of like a temporary um, herniation. 
the bottom right, you can see this is an uncus that's been herniated for at least a little while. Uh, it's very prominent there, bulging out, and you can see the hemorrhagic discoloration is kind of ischemia infarction of that due to the herniation. And then the bottom left, you see that dark red-brown discoloration of the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere. That's the distribution of the posterior cerebral artery. So this individ individual actually had bilateral discoloration like that, and that is um, because they had cerebral edema. They had bilateral uncle herniation. It pinched both posterior cerebral arteries and caused bilateral um, infarcts in the area of the, the distribution of the posterior cerebral arteries. So one thing is, as I was preparing for this note, some authors separate uncle and transtentorial herniation into two separate conditions. Robbins lists them both together, but some will list what's called transtentorial herniation or also called central herniation, where it's not hemorrhage of the unsi, but herniation of the midbrain and thalamus, so kind of the center portion of the brain. I just want to include that in there because Robbins lumps uncus and transtentorial herniation together, and it would be. The uncus is going uh, through where the uh, tentorium is. So what is occurring in these images? What's abnormal? What's normal? And continue when you're ready. So on the bottom left, what we can see is essentially a normal brain. The cerebellar tonsils are not molded against the brain stem, not pushed up against it. Whereas in the other two, it's the same individual. Uh, you see two different views but what you see is you see the cerebellar tonsils, they're notched at the base, and then they're pushed up against the uh, brainstem. So they've herniated through the frame and magnum, and they're pinching against the brainstem. This is the worst form of herniation because um, this can cause damage to the cardiac and respiratory centers in the brainstem and lead to death. So this is another example with uh, two other things you can see with tonsil herniation. In the top left, because of that um, herniation of the tonsillar tissue, um, it pinches off blood supply to it, and you can actually get necrosis. So in this case, the tissue's falling apart. Um, and the bottom right, sometimes you can see um, maybe um, impingement upon a, a venous structure, but not the arterial, and blood will get to that point, and you can see some um, congestion and hemorrhage. But those are both associated with individuals who had uh, cerebellar tonsillar herniation from edema. So what are other complications of herniation? Once again, stop, think about it, go on when you're ready. Two other things they will hear about are Kernahan's notch and a DeRay hemorrhage. So the bottom left shows a DeRay hemorrhage. Um, it's basically a midline hemorrhage in the brainstem. Um, the idea is due to kind of um, herniation in the brainstem, kinking of vessels within it, damage those vessels, and you get this midline hemorrhage. A lot of times when I've seen DeRay hemorrhage, it's not necessarily a nice midline hemorrhage. I think this is the classic appearance of it, but basically that hemorrhage in the uh, midbrain, which isn't always a nice streak down the middle. And then Kernahan's notch, basically what happens is you get the uncus herniates, pushes on the brainstem, and pushes the brainstem over to the other side where it pinches up against the tentorium and causes that notch. What that can do is that can cause hemiparesis ipsilateral to the lesion ipsilateral to the point of herniation instead of contralateral. So this is my best way to try and explain how Kernahan's notch works. You can see here this is we're looking at the the post we're looking at the uh, tentorium on both sides and you can see where the midbrain is coming up through you can see substantial nigger there. I've labeled the cruce cerebri or the cerebral peduncles. My understanding is that the cruce cerebri is just the white matter and the cerebral peduncles is the entire structure but sometimes cerebral peduncles is used interchangeably. But either or, <clears throat> if you had pressure from the uncus herniating and it's pushing in the direction of the arrow, it's going to push the brainstem over against where the X is. That's going to push it up against the tutorium like you can see. That's going to notch that um, those processes there and can lead to hemiparesis. Is there a fourth type of herniation? Once again, pause, go on when you're ready. Yes, so actually there is. So after a craniotomy, with the removal of a portion of the cranium, the edematous brain can actually herniate through the surgical defect, which is what you're seeing here. On the left side, the bottom portion of the image where it kind of looks friable and everything like that, it bulges out a little bit compared to the other side, and you can see it in cross-section really well. It's, um, it's, it was infarcted, it's hemorrhagic, 
there's several things going on, but you can see that bulge out the side. This was an individual who had a craniotomy but did not survive. And here's another example of it, looking down on the, um, the inferior surface of the brain. Uh, at the bottom portion of it, you can see all that brain matter that's kind of jutting out the side. That would be that herniation through the cranial defect. I think sometimes called kind of a mushroom herniation or that, but basically herniation through a surgical defect. And then since we're talking about herniation, we'll talk about um, how you treat it. Uh, or, sorry, um, edema. So if it's necessary, um, they can put in a drain, so ventriculostomy. Um, so they make a little burr hole in the cranium that you can see there at the top left. And then they put the, um, the, the, uh, the catheter into the ventricle to drain off their cerebrospinal fluid. So as I kind of say, so the brain can expand inward instead of outward and it doesn't herniate, can, can fill up those ventricle space because there's no fluid in there. But you can see here what happened was uh, missed it a little bit and there's a little ventriculostomy track there. So I always like these images for showing how, remember, when you're doing things to the body, you can cause injury to the body. Of course, with a demon herniation, especially tonsil herniation, the individual can die. Um, so they need that treatment. Okay, so summary. You tell me, since you can't really tell me, but what this is, this is a process called reflection. What it is, is it makes you go back and think about what I've just covered and what are major points. It's a good way to uh, learn material. So you tell me. Okay, uh, last picture. This is just from Montana. This is from the top of the uh, Beartooth Highway. This is one of the lakes up there. This is grizzly bear country. Um, this is around where I live. Thank you for watching.